we basically are just trying to make up our losses in the spring by making new more bees and we're not making them up. So, you know, if something's not done, it could be devastating. And what's already happened is we've lost probably half our commercial beekeepers in the country that have gone out of business. It's, uh, it would be a very sad state of affairs if we can't maintain our pollinators in this country. I mean, it would be, it would actually, it's nothing to do with this country, it would be the world would be affected. Hard to say exactly whenever a colony does perish, you know, what was the straw that broke the camel's back, but. For me to tell you what causes colony collapse is, would be pretty presumptuous on my part. Um, since all the scientists couldn't find what it was either. At one time they thought it was some novel pathogen that had come into the country and they tried to find it in the colonies that collapsed and they couldn't find it. Now they're trying to blame neonicotinoid pesticides saying that that's what it is, that it causes a sublethal effect on the bees and at some later point in time they crash. Prior to even CCD we had Varroa mite and Varroa another parasite that came from Asia. See globalization is not great for beekeeping. So basically these things get delivered by you know planes and ships. Then once we had it here, I think it started in Florida, we had prior to that a mite called a tracheomite Tracheal and varroa mites you know, were two parasites that we didn't have in North America before. Changed everything about beekeeping, really. Tracheal mite is a uh, microscopic mite that's okay. so small you can't see it with your eye, and it lives in the bees' breathing tubes. And it's been uh, in most of the honeybees in Europe for a very long time, and it, it finally managed to get here somehow. They're not really sure how. But the varroa mite is a, is a a mite lives on the outside of the bee and you know feeds in the brood. You can see it with your eye. It's about the size of a pinhead. It was a really difficult parasite because it's much more destructive to the host, you know, to our honeybees, than a parasite usually is. And that's because it was originally a parasite of a different species of bee in Asia. And so they were not in balance like a parasite usually is. If you have two or three varroa mites, it's questionable whether you should treat. If you have 10 varroa mites in a sample, you better be treating for varroa mites. The guy had 90 varroa mites. This is the beginning of the season, not the end. 10 in May would be huge. 90 in May, Jazak called him up and said, hey, you better come do something about these mites. He didn't do anything about his mites. He took his bees to Florida in the fall, and in November they all died. I mean, what the mites do, worse than the mites killing the bees directly, they vector disease. So basically, if you have an open sore and things, this is, this is like having something the size of a pie plate biting into you, and you can't take it off. You just can't get it off, and it's going to crawl around and bite you and leave open wounds. So it weakens the bee, and it starts to vector maybe viruses that are dormant normally, but then they start to get sick from them. Uh, forage can be a factor, okay? We have a problem sometimes even in Vermont where we have diverse forage. With hay cutting so aggressive things, we can actually, ha we can actually have a dearth of, of flowers in the middle of summer, which can be very dangerous. If you look at the, at the Champlain Valley now, some of my apiaries in right down in the valley um, used to be my best apiaries for honey production, and now they aren't. Is it neonicotinoids and some sublethal effect? causing them to be non-productive, or is it lack of forage? They've taken out the pastures where the white clover used to be. They've taken out the hedgerows where the brambles and the sumacs and the basswood trees and the wildflowers used to be. And they've plowed everything up and planted corn. And there's no honey in corn. And what's not corn is soybeans. And there's no honey in soybeans. So the, 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 the Champlain Valley is turning into a desert for honeybees. It's great for the farmers. They're making money selling corn. It's not so great for the beekeepers and the bees. This is a very immediate problem and possibly a very large problem that nobody seems to really understand. Uh, you used to wash your apples off to eat them. Okay, that doesn't do it anymore. The other major thing that's happened recently is systemic pesticides. Um, people don't know much about this, but we 
made a big switch with our pesticides to actual family of different complete family of pesticides. We used to use organophosphate pesticides. A lot of problems with organophosphate, water and things like this. So they came up with the systemic pesticides that are supposed to, they at least they thought were being better. The problem with systemic pesticides is they're ending up in the flower in the flower and the pollen and the nectar and possibly the fruit in some cases. At very low doses, they don't kill a bee necessarily, but the, the bees use the pollen for protein and they bring it back to feed to raise babies on and you're ending up having problems there, sublethal effects, and there's a, a, just a lot of evidence we're having a problem with this. I just testified on this in Montpelier a couple days ago. Um, the problem goes further in that we don't, we can't regulate the usage of all of these pesticides as well. And Vermont has no regulatory authority over treated seeds. Now the treated seeds contain the three most dangerous pesticides for pollinators. The problem is that we're, we're killing everything. We're not killing just the bugs we want to get. We're killing the soil possibly. We're killing microorganisms that are good. And then you end up with this completely artificial environment where you have to bring in the fertilizers. The soil is just a place to put the plant at a certain point. We don't tend to put a lot of emphasis and priority on the invertebrates. We have mostly a concern with higher life forms. And yet the Presidential Task Force on pollinators in May of 2015 declared that this is a crisis and said that we need to put seven million acres online to support pollinators, but they didn't really have a path or a plan to get us there. The EPA is starting to wake up to this problem. Uh, the government's starting to wake up to this problem. They're only 10, 14 years too late. I guess my best hope is that it's not as bad as it could be, yeah. um, but maybe it's worse than we think it is. The pollinators supply about one third of our food supply. And so it's not just the things you might think about. Chocolate is 100% pollinator dependent. Imagine the world without chocolate. <laughs> now are we motivated? Come on. So, and this affects our ecosystem. It affects worms and birds and bugs. And you know, we're, we're losing our bugs. When I was your age, we used to have to clean the windshields off, okay? Because of, of just major bug spattage in the, in the spring, especially, and sometimes in the fall. You don't see the bugs we used to have. And, and this, you know, birds eat bugs, these types of things, it goes on. There's a chain, of course, to all of this. So that's the concern. So my Gold Award project was um, centered around educating Addison County about what um, people, specifically homeowners with a yard or a garden, um, on how they could help are disappearing pollinators and so I realized just how much Vermont Vermont's economy is really based on agriculture it was concerning to me to see that bees were disappearing and there were you know news articles appearing left and right and I realized that that would be a real issue for the state that I love so much if you know the bees went extinct how much do you know about almonds? Almonds? Almonds. <laughs> Not that much. No. Do you, do you know about how much water they consume to get almonds? Yeah, a okay. lot, I do. Okay. That's one of those things. Almost everybody knows about the water that almonds consume and not about the bees. So it used to be that the native pollinators, which lived around the almond fields, would pollinate those almonds when they were in bloom. And that's no longer possible. There's just not enough of the native pollinators. Then there's not enough native honeybees. And so they've begun trucking in bees. And there's 600,000 acres of almonds in California, which means 1.2 million hives are being put on trucks and driven to California to, poll to pollinate the almonds. That's just almonds. That's just an example of what happens when there's enough stress on the pollinators that you can't get the job done. So there's many, many other things that will simply be inefficient to pollinate by hand or by any other mechanical means. And so that when your granddaughter is having her wedding, a fruit salad may be impossibly exotic to consider. It may be in something that's no longer, not that it'll be extinct, but it'll be impossibly expensive to imagine having a fruit salad at your granddaughter's wedding. And so there are many different plants that are pollinator dependent and all of them are at risk, that the pollinators are at risk. If we look back 100 years from now, we may feel 
proud of ourselves for putting solar fields in and not burning so much fossil fuel. We may feel proud for blocking the Keystone Pipeline, but we may rather wish we'd placed our priority on protecting our pollinators. Well, it is, uh, first, it is amazing how much the public knows already right now about bees, which is very different than the first half of my career, you know, where so many people, um, you know, it just seems like almost everyone knows a fair amount yeah, about bees now, whereas before hardly anybody, you know, knew, knew much of anything, but um, which, is, which is great. So here are two things that are burgeoning in the moment. This sort of opportunity, because there's space that's unused under solar panels and these more and more solar fields being built, and this decline in pollinators. You know, the, the consumer is the most powerful weapon that we have against these types of misuses. Um, I don't put it past the chemical companies to be very similar to the big tobacco and the big banks. It's not like these have ever lied to us before. I think they know there's a problem, but they're continuing to do this for profits, but at the expense of us and you and your children and your grandchildren and so on. If we can get this, this, this really abusive use of systemic pesticides under control, uh, that would help. That's in our power, um, sort of, <laughs> except there's huge companies that produce it who don't want us to have power over it. Um, we can control the mites and, uh, as best we can, and we do that successfully. Um, and we were doing that successfully, and then systemic pesticides came along, and it seemed really post-mite we're having more problems. So the problems work together in unison, and that's one of the biggest disadvantages. I, I really think, you know, my experience with, you know, keeping bees without treating them and, and trying to breed bees that can coexist with these mite problems, you know, I'm, I'm pretty convinced now that the, the mite problems and the weather are not going to pose a, a significant long, you know, existential threat to the honeybees. But the thing that, that will, that, you know, that is and that can is, is the poisoning of the environment. And I, that's what I think is the most important thing for the public to know and to realize that, you know, how important it is to support, you know, farming without chemicals, without pesticides. And that's really the basis of, of health for the bees in the future. I also just think that if you inform children yeah. early on, that knowledge in itself is sustainable. Now, I'm not going to say that these guys are wrong and that, that they're not suffering these losses. I just wonder, why would it be neonicotinoids? Why isn't it PPB? Yeah. Do you know what PPB is? No. no. PPB would be piss-poor beekeeping. 